Welcome to High Ridge Church Online. Here at High Ridge, we are a family of churches, and our hope is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. We have a lot of things going on at High Ridge Church. The best way for you to get the details you need for every event or ministry is on highridgechurch.com or by downloading the High Ridge app from the App Store or Google Play. You can also connect with us on any of our various social media platforms. If you have never joined us at one of our weekend services, we would love to have you. You can find directions and service times for each of our campuses online at highridgechurch.com. We encourage you to lean in with anticipation for what God is going to speak into your life. Thank you for joining us online today. Well, good to see you all. Welcome to church, everybody, and welcome to those who are watching online and to mom and dad. Welcome into church today. Can we give a little applause for Bob and Marge Klingenberg? Just a little friendship here. They watch and just wanted to give them a shout out. By the way, just to let you all know, both Longview and Graham are obviously busting at the seams, and we are as well. So just to let you know, this time, this time last year, our attendance is up about 15%. So be praying for the elders as we try to figure out a way how to expand as well to make room for your friends. You're bringing your friends and family to church, and we're so excited about that. They're meeting Jesus. They're being strengthened, and uh, thank you for doing that. All right, we're in a series studying marriage and family. How many of y'all enjoyed Pastor Tim Rivers last weekend? Isn't he awesome? Awesome teacher of the Word. And uh, so we're going to continue on that today. going to learn more about uh, family today is where we're going to focus in, and Don's going to be up in a minute. We're going to answer some questions and uh, so we're kind of tag teaming on today. So regarding marriage, I heard a guy the other day say that he told his wife she should learn how to embrace her mistakes. She smiled and reached out and gave him a big hug. <laughs> Speaking of family, what do, you, what do you call people who have a child? What do you call them? Parents. Right answer is parents. What do you call people who have more than one child? The right answer is referees. <laughs> We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3, if you want to go there. 1 Peter chapter 3, the theme that we're going to look at today is that love is the glue that holds relationships together. Love, love will keep us together. Yeah, I think Don and I should sing that. What do you all think? We used to sing in a band together. And uh, I sang the bass, I can sing some. So 1 Peter chapter 3, I want to help everybody today to be able to focus forward. Now, as soon as you say family, immediately things come up in our minds about how we were done wrong or as parents, mistakes that we've made. I'd just like to encourage you right now to just kind of wipe the slate clean. So just wipe the past back in, just put it back in the rearview mirror. We're going to move forward with some insights today that I believe are going to help your family life, married life, and all of your relationships to be blessed. Somebody in favor of that say amen. And so we can see this from 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter was married. Matter of fact, in the Bible, it tells us that he lived in, in and with his mother-in-law. Matter of fact, when we were in Israel, we saw the home. They've actually found Peter's mother-in-law's home. And uh, we were actually able to see it. And I thought about throwing some mother-in-law jokes in there, but uh, my mother-in-law might be listening, so I better not do that. So 1 Peter chapter 3, let's pick up in verse 7. I want to give you some insights, and then as I said, Don's going to join me. We're going to answer some questions. 1 Peter 3, 7. You husbands, in the same way, love your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker. Some, some your translations, your older ones say weaker vessel. Now, Everybody look here. That doesn't mean emotionally weaker. doesn't mean spiritually weaker. It just means, generally speaking, a female is not as strong as a male. Okay, so there, just, that, that's that. Let's go on. Since, <laughs> since she is a woman, and show her honor. I love that word. It means to appreciate. Show her appreciation as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. I love the concept of honor. I love it. Pastor Levi has given a message twice here at High Ridge about the importance of honor. Honor is so important. Honor up, honor down, and honor all around. Appreciate people around your life. And I was just prompted, I just want to honor people that make the worship services here at High Ridge Church Fort Worth. Make them awesome. And that would be our tech arts team and our worship team. Week in and week out. Come on, let's give them an applause. They do such a phenomenal, phenomenal job. 
Just a shout out and some love for you guys and girls back there. And by the way, if you'd like to join in and serve in that way, that's a great place to serve in the house. And so you can contact anybody that you saw on the platform or anybody that's, that's in the booth afterwards and they'll know how to help you to get in that place where you can help contribute to the blessings and then we'll honor you as well. All right, let's go on. To sum up, all of you be harmonious. It means to have a single focus. By the way, the best place to focus in marriage and family is on Jesus. Great, great focus. Sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Now, here's something I want you to grab hold of. Humility is a blessing. Pride is a curse. Someone asked me one time, what one thing do you think has done damage to marriages and families and to relationships more than anything else? And I'm here to tell you, I think it's pride. I think it's attitudes that we have rise up within us that don't come from God. Attitudes that cause us to want to make certain that we're getting things our way, that our rights are being observed and blessed. And all that does is drive people around us away. But humility... Humility is a blessing to everyone around your life. People love to be around humble people. People don't want to be around prideful people. So humility is a blessing and pride is a curse. And I just believe that's going to help someone today. Just the Holy Spirit would quicken to you right now the need to get rid of those prideful attitudes and to embrace some humility. Let's read on. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. That word blessing means to speak well words. Well plus words, good words, well words. So here, here's the thought. Don't just think kind words, say them. Speak them out. They, they put strength in the heart of those who hear you speak those words to them. So speak those kind words. And then in verse 10, the apostle Peter then begins to quote out of the book of Psalms, Psalm 34. To the one who desires life, to love, and to see good days. Now, if I look here, I want to conduct a little survey. How many of you all want to be loved? Can I see a lifting of hands? How many of you all want to love? How many of you all want to have a good, blessed life? Now, if you didn't raise your hand, there's something wrong with you. Because all of us have an innate need to love and be loved, and all of us are trying to have a blessed life, Right? That's why we're here today. That's why we, we, we eat the right food sometimes. That's, that's why we, I notice I said sometimes for some of your sake. Uh, we, we, we really want to have a blessed, good life. Well, that comes to us from the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Bible says this. Now, what will keep you from having a blessed life, the three things are given right after this. So follow along with me. Here we go. Everybody that wants love, to be loved and to love, everybody that wants a blessed life, here are the three things that you need to pay attention to. You must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Number one, your words give you a blessed life or a cursed life. Let's look at the second one. He must turn away from evil and do good. Listen, if you allow yourself to participate, to think, to speak, to be in things that are evil, you're not gonna be loved and you're not gonna love and you're not gonna have a blessed life. Things won't go good with you if that's the case. But if you will push evil away, listen, every time I teach, Every time the Holy Spirit gives me a burden from the scripture to give you something that I pray that he quickens my voice to help you to be able to grab hold of something that will help your life. I'm hoping and I'm praying that the bad will be pushed out and the good will be brought in. That's what I hope every time. And so when the Bible says to get away from evil and do good, I want to help you to get away from evil like pride like frustration, like bad words, and I want to help you to get into a place of blessing, like humility and kind words and speaking things that give life to people around you. And that's what helps us to have a blessed life. And then thir here's the third one. You, you got to see this. This is important. He must seek peace and pursue it. So a blessed life has to do with your words, has to do with getting rid of evil and embracing good, has to do with, the third is, is to seek peace and pursue it. See, when you choose peace, then you cancel strife. Peace cancels strife. Now, go forward to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. I want you to see this love again. So I asked you a moment ago, we did a little survey off of verse 10. How many of y'all want to be loved and to love? Everybody said yes. So love is awesome, right? Somebody say amen. Verse 8 of chapter 4. This is, this is phenomenal. Look at this. Above all, somebody say above all. Keep fervent in your what? In your love for one another because love covers. Somebody say love covers. 
Love covers a multitude of sins. So I want to show you what he's talking about here. I have a towel, a white towel, and wrapped up in this white towel is a ball. It's, a, it's actually a therapy ball. Ooh, stop right there. That I'm supposed to be laying on on the floor and rolling. It's, I'm supposed to be rolling it on my back to stimulate the nerves to grow back that got messed up last year. I'm not doing that very much, just confession. <laughs> so this represents sin. Can everybody see this blue ball? Can you all see it on the camera? There it is. Ooh, my cowboy boots are showing up on camera. <laughs> I think my mom got me these boots. <laughs> so this is sin. Everybody get it? Yeah. This is love. What did love do to that ball? Can anybody in here or anybody on the camera, can anybody see that blue ball or any part of that blue ball? Can you see it? Why can't you see it? Because it's completely covered up. That's what love does. Love covers sins. Now listen, I'm not here today encouraging you to not report a crime if someone around your life is committing a crime. That's not love. I'm not here today telling you that you should pacify and encourage People's addictions and bad habits, uh, that, you're to, that you're to laugh and smile when they're angry and when they're cursing. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that you need to make the choice to love the people that are around you that you might not like. Because the Bible tells us to love them. And what love does is, is it covers a multitude of sins. When you choose to love people, your spouse, your children, your parents, those that you work with, your family members, your extended family, when you choose in spite of the things they do to aggravate you, when you choose to love them, it covers over a whole bunch of sins, and guess who? Theirs and yours. And that's a kingdom dynamic that I think will bless every single one of us. Love covers sins. All right, so may it be that we can do that. Here are three pointers. Go ahead, honey, and make your way up here because I'm gonna go through these really quick. Three pointers. The first one is this. You should... Love someone by sticking with them through hard times. Stick with them. Health challenges, job challenges, disappointment, love sticks with them. Here's the second one. You should show love by making adjustments. I heard it said this way. Flexible people rarely get bent out of shape. That's pretty good, isn't it? Make adjustments. So you don't like something, make an adjustment. Is what you don't like, is it a sin? Well, then make an adjustment if it's not. You can change. You can still change. God wants to change you. And then here's the third one. You show love by reaching beyond your comfort zone. So Dawn's gonna come, we're gonna answer some questions. I just wanna say she reached beyond her comfort zone this year for Valentine's. So she blew me away. On the Monday before Valentine's, she, uh, she gave me a Valentine's present that was tickets to a Mavericks basketball game. And it was pretty awesome. So she made the choice to reach beyond her comfort zone. She doesn't even watch the Mavericks basketball games with me when I'm watching them at home. She, she's doing something else, but she knew that I would love that. But I sit and, by him while he watches them. So yeah. I get points for that. Sits by me, yeah. And laughs when I laugh at J.J. Bray. I love him. And, um, and anyway, I was making a point. He just knocked me off my groove. So he's going to go to a musical with me because oh, yeah. I went to a basketball game with him. Yay? Thank you. I was so happy on the way home from the Mavericks game, I said something stupid. Guys, have you ever done this? <laughs> Since you went with me to a basketball game, I'll go with you to a musical. And I went, oh, as soon as I said it, I went, oh, why did I say that? Why did I say that? So uh, we got a prescription for Valium. And... Um, <laughs> I'm going to take one before we go to the musical. <laughs> okay, so, so what we're doing this year is uh, we're answering questions off of a survey done by a Christian family, uh, husband and wife doctor team, did a survey in January 2018. It's 778 responses back from Christian families, singles, adults around America. They categorized them, and here are the top 10 categories that the questions were asked in. So I just put a question I put a question you'll see on the screen that would tie into a category that people like us want answers to, okay? And so the real brains of the outfit is going to answer those questions. Okay, so here we go. Here's the first question. How can I do a good job with my children as a single parent? Okay, so single parenting is much more common today probably than ever before. And um, I've been doing a Wisdom for Moms group for a long time. We've gone from, you know, the 
all, you know, parent, same mom, same dad, same household, to step parents, to single parents, to single dad, single mom, all those things. And those are all issues that people have questions about. And so I can talk about this because my mom was a single mom. And um, I want to share with you the very best thing that you could do as a single parent. And this is what my mom did for us is she kept us in church. And so the church became a family for us when my dad decided to leave. And the church became a support system for us, and they helped us, and they encouraged us, and it was so powerful. The, the church will always be family to me because of what God put in my heart as a young girl when I didn't have a dad. And so I just want to encourage you, if you are a single parent, keep your kids in church. Go to church with them and be a part of that. Um, but I do have some things to say. You know, as far as a single parent or if you have a, both parents in the home, whatever it may be, all parents can set some goals for parenting with your kids. And the first thing I want to encourage all parents to do is to dedicate your kids to the Lord. You know, we have child dedication here where we um, encourage parents to, to dedicate their kids and we pray over them. We agree as a church body to encourage them and strengthen them. That's a very important thing to do because our kids belong to the Lord anyway. You know, we just get them for such a short time. And so dedicate your kids to the Lord. Dedicate your time as a parent to the Lord and let the Lord help you as you raise your children. The second thing you can do, and this is going to sound funny, I know, not popular, but command your children. I always like to say this, someone has to be the parent, it might as well be you. And the Bible talks about that. Um, God told Abraham, for I've chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. We're supposed to tell our kids what to do. And so don't be afraid to be a parent, to command your children. They need you to set boundaries for them. They need you to help them understand life and to make good decisions. And we do that by commanding, by training, by disciplining, and helping our kids. Do you yes? know what Abraham told, uh, what God told Abraham's wife? Yes, I do. Moving on. Um, <laughs> okay, he said, call him Lord. Call him yes, Lord. yes, my Lord. Okay, number three. <laughs> Affirm them. You can affirm your children. Your children need to know that you love them and that you are pleased with them. So every opportunity that you have, affirm your kids. Tell them they did a great job. Tell them you're proud of them. Tell them you love them. And so that affirmation is really important. Another thing you can do is protect your kids. We're supposed to protect our kids as they grow up. Protect them from relationships that might harm them. Protect them from making bad decisions. Protect them in all kinds of ways as they're growing up because they need our help and protection. We are just a little bit older than them, and we've been through just a few things. And so we can help our kids by protecting them. And the very last thing all parents can do is to release your kids. I always like to say that we hold our children with an open hand. Remember I said that God gives them to us for just a season? So we hold them with an open hand, and when they grow up, we release them because we want them to be in the place that God wants them to be so their lives will be blessed. And so all parents can do these with their children. What about when they move back in? <laughs> you receive them and love them. That's not even a question. I was going to try to. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have your kids move out and move back in and move out and move back in? Thank you. Have you Call noticed they eat more every time they move back home? <laughs> anyway, okay. We love having a full house. Yes, we do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I agreed. Verbally. Next question. Next question. Technology has stolen my children. How can I get them back? Well, this is a really big topic. You know, as I mentioned, I do Wisdom for Moms group on Thursday mornings, and this topic comes up quite often, um, especially now there's that game Fortnite, I think it's called. Oh, first service had the same reaction. It's stolen a bunch of husbands, too. It's stolen a bunch of husbands. So husbands, kids, same topic. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> She's on fire. <laughs> I'll stop there. I have so many moms that will say their kids come home from school or from sports practice. They grab something to eat real quick and run to the room, and they're in there all evening playing Fortnite. And they have to go in at bedtime and say, turn it off. So one of my suggestions would be don't let them have that in their room. You have a computer or something like a game system or whatever, have it in a common area where you can see what they're doing, and the whole family is there. And so that you're putting in some protection because you're right there with them. But here's a few suggestions also. 
One thing we can do as parents is get educated. Get educated about technology, what your kids are doing, how they're using it, things like that. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to get into their world. You need to do that. You know, our kids are so smart. If you put in all kinds of blockers on all your devices, they're still going to figure out a way to get around them. Because one thing I've learned is that my kids are smarter than me. They're not in here. Okay. So... um, (laughs) But they're very smart, and kids are smarter younger even. I can give my little two-year-old my cell phone, and she will swipe her way through and find, a, you know, PBS or something. It's scary. I was just going to say, she you took my phone the other day, and, and it's, it's uh, number blocked, password blocked. So she handed it back to me and kind of made a grunt like, unlock it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. So get educated. The next thing you can do is uh, get online. If your kids are on Facebook, you should have a Facebook account. Not so you can stalk your children. You don't have to like all their posts or tag yourself in everything they do, but so that you know what they're doing and you see people they're interacting with. If they have Twitter, if they have Marco Polo, if they have, I forgot this other one that they use all the time, Snapchat. Uh, There's so many, and they're always coming up with new ones. It's almost like as soon as parents figure out they're using this one, they move to another one. And so you've got to stay up with the times. You've got to... Um, figure out what they're doing and be a part of that. If your child plays on an Xbox or a gaming system, then play on that. You may be terrible. I remember when my kids played Mario Kart and they were like, Mom, play with us. And I was terrible at it. I crashed all the time. And they're like, how do you drive a car? So it's <laughs> completely different. But anyway. Was that before or after Pac-Man? After. After. <laughs> so... <laughs> Anyway, so what your kids are doing, find out about and be a part of that. Um, Another thing is don't overreact. You know, your child uh, uses technology and the technology isn't a problem. It's the use or abuse of that technology that can be a problem. So you as a parent need to help your child understand the pitfalls, the dangers of it. It's just like when your kids get to be 15 years old or so and you start teaching them how to drive. You teach them about the dangers of driving because you want them to be safe. Well, we need to teach our children how to navigate that wide world web thing so that they understand the dangers and they don't fall into something that they never intended to fall into. World Wide Web. Another thing you need to know is their friends. How well do you know your kids' friends? Can you name their top five closest friends? So I want to encourage you parents, invite them to your house and get to know them. Get to know their parents. Spend time talking to them. But definitely get to know who your, friend, who your kids' friends are so that you can have a good influence on them as well. And here's a secret. If you'll have them over to your house and get to know them, you can influence their friends for good. You can put God things into their lives, and you can help them to grow and to develop as well. And that's a great privilege. Um, As I mentioned before, getting to know the other parents, you might be surprised what you learn about your own child by talking to your child's best friend, parents. So get to know other parents. Uh, Another thing we advocate is know your kids' passwords. Now, I know some parents are like, you know, that's an invasion of my, of my child's privacy. Did they buy that phone and pay for that service? Or are you, did you buy it and are you paying for their service? Because in my eyes, that's yours. So um, get their passwords so that you're able to access stuff. Put as many guards as you can on things and, um, you know, insert yourself into that. You're the parent. Be the parent. So um, I remember when you said one time when that was kind of being debated and somebody said, and you put your foot down and said, that's my phone. You just get to use it. There you go. Um, anyway, so those are some ideas for you. There's a book called The TechWise Family by Andy Crouch, and he has a list of 10 commitments that families can make about technology. Now, you can take those and use those as a template to come up with your own commitments, but you and your kids can sit down and talk about it. It just gives you an open door to have a discussion about things that maybe you haven't thought about, some things that you can talk with them about, you can come up with a plan together, and then have them sign off on it that you agree together. Because we don't want technology to rule our lives or to take our children. We want to still be able to be the biggest influence on our kids' lives. Okay, the next question is, with the shift toward overprotecting children, how can I help my child become independent? So the whole everybody gets a trophy thing. How, how would you deal with that? Well, that's not really a question, but how everybody gets a trophy. We're okay. all winners. All right. <laughs> um, one of my favorite things that someone told me a long time ago when Bethany was really small was never do for your child what they can do for themselves. So my kids grew up making their own lunch for school. Therefore, they could never complain about what they got to eat for lunch. And if they didn't get up early enough, they simply didn't get a lunch. And I remember one of my friends went to a parenting um, seminar, and she came back with this best phrase that I love to adopt. They taught her to say, when your child 
um, messes up, makes a mistake, maybe forgot his lunch or didn't get his school books or didn't get his homework, that you say, hmm, it seems like you have a problem. I was like, that is genius. I love that because that puts a responsibility on your child. I will tell you this just real quick. Uh, Josiah was in a school where on Thursdays they had to wear a jacket. And shortly after he started going, and of course, he forgot to take his jacket for chapel. And so he called me, Mom, I have to have my jacket. I need my bow tie. I'm, you know, I need you to bring it. So I took it to the school. I walked into the school office, and I said, this is for Josiah Kleinberg. And she looked at me. She goes, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're enabling him, aren't you? <laughs> I was like... I'm a terrible mom. So she was teaching me that lesson, though, that he needed to suffer the consequences of his decisions. He needed to accept responsibility. And so if we are always accepting responsibility for our kids, they never learn to take responsibility for themselves. So if we want our kids to grow up and become adults and have their own lives, we've got to let them be responsible, and they do need to suffer the consequences of their decisions. Good answer. Next question. How can I get my kids to talk to me? You're really good at that. <laughs> so Jeff and I, I've mentioned before, you know, we grew up in two completely different homes. His family talked to each other. They laughed. They had fun together. They ate dinner together. There were lots of communication going on, sometimes too much. But my family did not do that. We were not as close. Um, we didn't just sit down and talk about our day or anything like that. And so as we were dating and got to know one another and decided to get married and thinking about our future, I really wanted that to be a part of our home. And so thinking about how do you get your kids to talk to you is you communicate with them. You teach them how to communicate with you. So you look for times and places where you can do that. So I would pick my kids up from school. Whoever got to get to the car first would sit in the front seat and they get to tell me about their day. And, you know, we learned how to ask those questions so there were no cell phones allowed in the car. Do you know car time is a great time to have family time if you're driving? Because every family I know is so busy these days driving from one event to another. And so that car time can be a great time for you to have communication with your kids and to take turns asking questions and sharing life together. So car time is a great time. The dinner table. Now, I know a lot of families these days don't get to have dinner together. It could be breakfast. It could be lunch on Saturdays. Whatever time you have where you can get together with your kids and put away all your devices and pay attention to each other and ask questions is a great time to build that conversation time. So, you know, we had to be intentional with building that into our kids because we get distracted too. And um, we need to be intentional towards that. So if you want that with your children, you want them to talk to you, you have to talk to them. And you have to be willing to get into their world and ask them questions, not just yes, no questions, but questions that show that you're really invested in their, their school or in their activities or whatever it is. So. Good answer. Okay. Respect. With all of the disrespect in our culture, how can I teach my children to be respectful? Would you say that that is something really huge in our culture today, that there's so much disrespect everywhere? And so we really need to adopt that, the culture of respect into our homes. And so there are lots of ways that you can do that. A lot of that has to do with communication. But you and I as parents, we get to model that for our kids. So we often talk about, you know, Pastor Levi, when he said, honor up, honor down, honor all around. If you choose to honor in your home, your children will learn that as you honor your kids, as you teach them to honor their father or their mother. And so when our kids were little, Jeff did that really well by teaching our children, you know, at the dinner table, wasn't that nice of mom to fix dinner? Say, thank you, mom. And they say, thank you, mommy, you know, and then, you know, just different things like that that you can do to build honor in your children. You can help them to have honor for their mother or for the father by encouraging it, teaching it, and helping them do it as well. So communicating with them, getting on their level and talking to them. You know, if your kids are little, get down on their level, communicate with them eye to eye. You're honoring them and you're helping them to learn how to communicate as well. I said this last week and um, it's very true because I know this because I have four guys in my life that I've helped raise. Um, if a male is not looking at you, ladies, they're probably not listening to you. So if you want to get their attention and have them receive what you're saying, look them in the eyes and talk to them. And that is also respectful too because if you want to talk to someone, you want them looking at you so they're hearing what you have to say. So you set the standard for your kids. You bring correction when it's needed. You encourage them at every opportunity and build that culture of respect in your home. That's it. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, uh, the other five questions from the survey next week, and uh, we're going to invite our 27-year-old son and 25-year-old daughter to join us in answering the questions. I have a feeling I'm in for trouble. So I'll just be facilitating, and Don and, and uh, Jonathan and Brianna will be answering the questions next week. So bring a friend. It'll be church unusual, but it'll be usual because the Holy Spirit will be here, and he'll be speaking. So I want to pray for everybody. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes for a second? How many of you all would say, Pastor Jeff, I want love to increase in all of my relationships. Would you just lift your hands? How many of you all would say, you can put your hands down. How many of you all would say, we've got some strife going on and I'd sure like to have peace. Can you lift your hands? Lord God in heaven, I pray for these two things. To be released again into the lives of these wonderful people. Lord, I just want to thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, for your blessings. For love increasing in our hearts even right now as we pray and for peace increasing in our hearts right now as we pray. We just rejoice and give you thanks that you hear and answer our prayers. Thank you, Lord. Okay, you can put your hands down. One more prayer before we go. If everyone would just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a moment. This prayer is for those of you that would say, Jeff, you know, in all honesty, I don't have this God thing figured out yet. If I'm completely honest, I'm not certain that I'm going to go to heaven and be with God at the end of my life whenever that might be. I have my doubts. Well, friend, if that describes you, I want to encourage you right now to not have doubts any longer. I want to encourage you to pray a simple prayer with me right now that God promises to hear. You don't need to have doubts. You see, Jesus is here right now, and he wants to do something for you that you can't do for yourself. He wants to forgive your sins, all of them, past, present, and future. The question is, is will you let him? My question would be, why not let him do it right now? If you're here and you say, Jeff, you describe me, what do I do? Well, friend, you pray with me. If you believe it in your heart and mean it from your heart, God promises to hear this prayer. He will forgive your sins.